My name is Ann Kim. I'm co-founder and CEO of a startup called Secure AI Lab for Sale. And so Sale has made a marketplace for data scientists to access clinical data for drug repurposing, as well as benefiting hospitals and biobanks who can also participate in collaboration as well as increase revenue generated from uh, their data sets. And so the technology basis for this company comes out of MIT's Computer Science and AI Lab, or CSAIL, as well as my graduate studies at the MIT Media Lab in clinical trial data sharing using federated learning, uh, a variant or another name for edge computing that Mohawk mentioned earlier. And so prior to my graduate studies, I did a number of uh, clinical research studies at MIT in both genomics as well as EHR. And the big problem that both me and data scientists in health share is that 30% of our time is spent acquiring data. Data is extremely important for research, as uh, Catherine Gallagher mentioned in the previous talk, and it's outrageous how long it takes to get this data. So the standard operating procedure is that you have to curry favor in your network of hospitals as well as other researchers to find the data set that you're looking for. And this can take somewhere around like three months or so. And then after you find the proper data set, your institutional lawyers have to talk to the hospital lawyers over the series of like six to 18 months, which is called an internal review board. And then after they come to a conclusion of how the data is gonna be used and how to compliantly use the data, you have to beseech overburdened IT teams to anonymize the data, which has problems in two ways. First, we know that anonymization is not perfect and you can highly identify even anonymized data. This is especially true in healthcare. Second, the data anonymization process necessarily takes out a lot of salient information for innovation. And then third, uh, the final leg of the transfer of the data is a physical journey. Oftentimes, these data sets are so large that you have to send unencrypted hard drives in the mail to your research collaborators in order to get the data to them. And so obviously, this process is pretty broken. Uh, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be process for clinical data handling and it should be you know, taken with due diligence and take a fair amount of time, but at the same time we need something more efficient because we see that you have exponential increase in innovation, for example, in biomarker discovery if you have more data. And so this is a proof of concept that SAIL did with a major pharmaceutical company in the Boston area. So this is an international company that needed to work with three different hospitals internationally. And so this data scientist wanted to do microbiome data uh, analysis across three different hospitals. And so we were able to use something called federated learning in order to send the algorithms to the hospitals, train locally, and then extract analysis as opposed to moving any of the data. And in order to further validate and verify any of the um, computation that was happening, we used something called a secure enclave which has a physical cryptographic guarantee of correctness. And so the technologies that we use are federated learning uh, as well as secure enclaves, and then we also use differential privacy and blockchain in order to further verify and vet uh, the whole consensus mechanism of what is actually happening in this process. Uh, and so this gives us some core advantages. First, we have an easy to use interface, such that data scientists only have to program in Python in order to access the data that they need. Second, it's easy for the IT team as well as legal team to monitor and audit the whole process of data sharing and data collaboration. Third, this is highly scalable. We can scale on-premises as well as in the cloud, and this is really important for our customers who are hospitals and pharma companies. And so if you have any problems in accessing data or um, in a highly regulated space, we'd be happy to partner and work with you on a pilot. Thanks. Good morning, I'm Ned Semenai. I'm with a company called uh, Southie Autonomy. Uh, yes, we are located in South Boston, and what we're doing is so advanced, it's criminal. Um, let, me, uh, let, let me start, first of all, by framing uh, why we're doing this, and uh, I really appreciate Vincent's talk, because we're essentially productizing everything that he talked about today. Um, we're, we are seeing advantages in robotics now and automation, increased productivity, lower costs, safer work environments, things like that. Um, but yet, did you know that really today, the penetration is, is very low. It's only about 10%. And, and so if you look at why that is, it's because it's still very expensive to, to do this. And the costs are, um, are not just in, in the robot hardware itself, but it's been all the other things. So what's happening is today, 
a lot of the things that happen in automation in production environments are still very manual. So we're trying to attack this cost. The hardware itself is only about 20%. The programming is something that uh, is, is difficult, has to be done by experts. And if you, if you change the job, if it's not something that's continuous, one after another 24-7, then you need to reprogram. And then there's engineering, so building safety around the robot, fixturing, getting the material to the robot, where it's going to go, and all that. And what we're doing is we're trying to take those costs out so that really you're just uh, down to the cost of the robot itself. So we're building a, uh, a new uh, software layer that sits between the user and the robot. And the user's important because they're the person that has to ultimately get the robot to do this new task. So to, uh, to illustrate this uh, quickly, let me show you a quick video. So this is uh, Lisa, who ha happened to be walking through our lab, and we said, Lisa, come program this robot. She said, uh, I have no idea how to program a robot. I've never seen a robot. So we filmed her after, about two minutes after she walked up. And what you're going to see here is she takes our magic wand, which is our user interface using augmented reality. She uh, points to, in this case, to some bar of soap. And then she also points to some shampoo bottles. And then she clicks on a menu that's projected on this table to say execute. And then the robot will go ahead and, on its own, identify the uh, objects that are there and will pick them up and place them in the box. Now, this is very, uh, very simplified, but this is a good illustration of, it, of exactly the, um, the intelligence that we're providing. We do, our user interface, we do call it the wand, the magic wand. Everybody loves Harry Potter. Nobody likes, as we said earlier, as we heard earlier, no one likes artificial intelligence. It's threatening. Um, and in this case, very, very specifically, people are um, being used just to task the robot. They go off and can do something else. And then when the robot's done, they can repurpose the robot. So here's an example of one of our pilots. Um, this is an automotive company that makes uh, bearings. You can see uh, on, on the floor to the left, there are these round metal sleeves that come from China, and those uh, center bearings need to be heat treated. So right now, the heat treatment specialist has to, whenever these, one of these pallets arrive, he has to take all those bearings and put them in this special basket, which then goes into an oven. And he's not, you know, he, he doesn't want to be doing this, but it's such a low um, time-consuming job that it's just part of his job. He has to do it. So now by using our robot, or our software, they can now cost justify a robot, um, get payback within a year, and then savings after that to have the robot do not just one thing, but many different things that are part of their process, which is typical inside uh, an organization. So in manufacturing, these, typically, these kind of things that are short duration typically happen at the beginning of the production line and at the end. And we're also looking, um, uh, right now we see a lot of applications in consumer goods and in medical. And you can see some of the things that we want the robot to do. So we're actively seeking for more pilots and of course also always for more investment. Thanks. How many of you work at companies that develop software? For how many of you is that a large economic investment that entails a lot of potential risk or concern about productivity? Silver Thread is a software economics company. Uh, we focus on both the technical health of the assets that you are developing within your organization and the economic impact uh, that that has on your bottom line. 50% of the money that is spent globally on software is probably wasted in one way or another, either because decision making is poor at the portfolio level um, or because people are operating in a suboptimal fashion inside individual systems. One of the things that we find when we do uh, technical assessments using our tooling of software code bases is that while you would expect or hope that you have a nice hierarchy of modules with good tight APIs and uh, layers and reuse and all the motherhood and apple pie of software architecture, often we find that that's not true when we use graph theory and AI to, to assess large code bases. That leads to developers not understanding what they're doing, that leads to risk and productivity problems. We've done a lot of work doing a, a lot of assessment of these code bases from a technical perspective, but also used a lot of statistical techniques to tie that to your business outcomes. Based on that, we've built uh, three different products uh, and associated services on top of them. We can go into a corporation and measure the health of individual code bases across a portfolio and give you a heat map of where your technical health uh, stands and also where the economics uh, that are likely to 
to result stand in your, your organization. We could do a deep dive on the on both the technical and the economic aspects of individual code bases for strategic decision making purposes. People use that tool for M and A due diligence, for keeping contractors accountable, for doing a high level assessment within your your own organization as to whether you should refactor a code base or rewrite it entirely based on an economic ROI driven uh, analysis as opposed to something that is subjective and potentially political. And then finally we've developed tools to help developers fix those code bases that are challenged but where it is uh, both economically rational and technically feasible to improve them and to also measure the economic benefits that result across an organization. Here's an, here's an example of a company that we worked with. These are 100 major systems that were assessed, and in some cases, uh, we determined that the code base was relatively healthy. So you can put tools in place to help them stabilize and make sure that those code bases do not go bad. In other examples, we found that there were challenges, but they were both fixable, and there was a positive ROI likely to happen if you did improve the technical health of those code bases. In one example that I'm going to get into in the next slide, uh, the team that improved that code base had their productivity triple uh, because of the improvements that they made. And then finally, there are um, several cases where we found code bases that were just too far gone. Right? They had been around for 50 years or 20 or 15 years, and people were just throwing good money after bad. We were able to understand that it would be better to rewrite those in their entirety. And I would say for this customer, they saved hundreds of millions of dollars just because they could make that decision in a more effective, data-driven way. Now, in the example that I showed where someone actually improved their code base, um, they uh, started at the 20th percentile on the predictive analytics for cost, waste, feature time, time to develop uh, features, and so forth. Over the course of a few months, they used our product to help them do a guided refactoring. And ultimately, they were able to get themselves up close to the 80th percentile. Given that our cost was much lower than the benefits, we were able to prove after the fact that we had a positive ROI. And to give you a sense of what the benefits were, there was a 16% reduction in bugs, a 76% increase in lines of code produced per year, 33% of developer FTE optionality, and 52% less waste. So these are the types of things that within your company we can help you understand. Um, do you have a system um, you know, with ongoing budget quality and performance challenges? Uh, do you need to evaluate the work done by others? Uh, and would these kinds of objective metrics and the ability to do decision making across a portfolio help you? If so, come see us at our, our booth after, after this uh, talk. Thank you. Hi, my name is Waikit Lau. Uh, I'm an MIT alum at uh, WCS back in the 90s and then did my graduate studies at the other school in Cambridge, uh, less well-known school in Cambridge. Um, so what do we do? We are Remote HQ. We build collaborative virtual computing platforms. That's a mouthful. What is it, what is it really? Uh, the best way to describe it is via uh, an analogy. So you think about Dropbox. Dropbox is cloud storage. Before Dropbox came along, uh, you can get cloud storage by calling up your IT or DevOps, right? And they provision you and your team some cloud storage uh, and you access, access it. But it is neither very usable or user friendly. So we are essentially doing the computing equivalent of Dropbox, where we have uh, ways to essentially, well, ways to essentially uh, spin up virtual machines without technical knowledge and you can figure out, you, you can essentially uh, name what kind of virtual machines you guys want, high GPU machines, CPU machines, uh, just a browser in the cloud um, and the like. And our use case is collaboration, right? So today, when people think about remote collaboration, it's screen share. Screen share have a lot of problems. You can't edit together, can't be synchronous. When you close your laptop, the other guy can't see it. Uh, you've got bad up screen bandwidth, you get frozen screen, and then you've got privacy and security uh, issues because you're sharing the entire desktop. So what we do here is the old way is screen share, the new way we can essentially spin up a virtual machine that can be a browser in the cloud or any app and pipe that machine collaboratively to all the people who have joined that virtual room. And uh, it's secure, it is by default uh, disposable and ephemeral. Uh, we can set policies to make it persist. And here's an example of this in action. 
So here, my colleague and I are spinning up a Jupyter notebook, and we are is immediately and instantly making a Jupyter notebook collaborative um, without any software installation. I can hand over control to him, and now he's going in to debug some of the code. And we've wrapped audio and video around this. So essentially what this is, it's, it's an encapsulation technology. We can encapsulate any applications, web-based or otherwise, and make it collaborative and the collaboration is done through any browser. So very, very simple and user-friendly. Um, uh, we have got about 50 to 100 companies using us right now. Gannett is one of them. Uh, we have about 30 to 40 employees using it for collaboration internally, all the way from very sundry stuff, such as PowerPoint, uh, Excel, to collaborating over the, uh, the, dash uh, the dashboard of their product as they're building internally, just in terms of product feedback, as well as using it for sales and support. So when someone calls in, they just send them the link, and the person and the support agent joins uh, the collaborative browser in the cloud, and uh, they can resolve issues very easily. So these are all the use cases that we've got uh, companies and customers of ours using today. Team collaboration, sales demo, support, onboarding, onboarding and training. Um, you know, if you think that we could be helpful in smoothing out and making your collaboration much more effective, uh, come talk to us and we're happy to show you more uh, at the booth. Thank you. All right, I'm going to take this outside the, uh, <laughs> the dais for a minute. So my name is Beth Porter. I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of Riff Analytics. We changed our name recently, so we're Rift Learning in the brochure that you've got. Um, we are an AI-powered uh, communications platform that helps organizational behavior change happen at scale. We come out of the Human Dynamics Lab, uh, it's, uh, Sandy Petten's lab at the Media Lab, and all the co-founders and I work together in that lab to preview and test and now have launched this technology for organizations to use. One of the problems that we see is soft skill development. We're way on the other end of all the AI stuff that you've seen here today. We really put humans at the center of what we're doing. And one of the problems that we've identified is that people spend a lot of money on training and coaching, and particularly at the leadership level, right? Managers are trying to figure out how to operate inside of organizations, particularly high growth organizations that are experiencing an enormous amount of change and they need to tra train a lot of people, particularly in management and soft skills. So, has this helped? Who knows? 60% of the managers fail in the United States every single year. <coughs> Our number of women in management still lagging significantly behind men. Millennials say, I'm leaving because I hate my manager. You can give me all the money you like, but I'm still leaving. So this is a real problem. How do we actually evaluate whether any of our training and coaching problems are doing their job? Is there some way that we can figure out how to train and coach people better inside of gigantic organizations and high growth organizations? <coughs> and measure that effect over time. So the Rift platform gives you real-time feedback during coaching and training scenarios. We can wrap ourselves around any kinds of problems that you want to scenarioize or give to people, and we give a particular kind of feedback. We give real-time feedback when people are interacting with one another, and we give post-meeting and post-encounter feedback so that you can learn more about how that encounter looked like over uh, the, the entire duration of that meeting and over time. We give a long history of all the different encounters and meetings that you have. It's a passive measurement tool that uses speech only, no text analysis, just vocal signal data. And then we can derive from those simple measures, right? S speech is very easy to measure, we measure it all the time we can derive some very complex things that are hard to measure. Specifically, we measure dominance, influence, and lots of other socio-emotional characteristics, and we're building a model of collective intelligence from those measures. I'll give you one use case. We work with universities, we work with innovation teams, we work with all different kinds of corporations, small and large, 
Here's one, Grant Thornton, the seventh largest, excuse me, seventh largest tax and accounting firm in the world. They have 7,000 or plus employees, and all of their managers, everybody who is you know, going through the management cycle at the company goes through their leadership development and leadership training program to improve their interpersonal skills specifically. Not just technical skills, not just the job skills they need, but their leadership development uh, program. And they look for these exact factors. Engagement, dominance, influence, bias, the ways that people work together to be effective over time. When we give them this feedback, people change their behavior. They change how they interact with one another, and that in turn leads to change in the organization and makes them more successful together. So we are looking for people who have large learning and development challenges and large coaching organizations who can help us reach people, right? Not only build our uh, understanding of the scenarios in which this would be applicable, but also just in, in, you know, enhance and embellish the programs that are already exist today. So uh, where we're flirting, come see me afterwards. Sorry, we can't lift. Uh, come see me afterwards at the tables. Thanks. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Boaz Efroni. I'm a VP of Marketing and Business Development for Light Intelligence. Um, I'll try to take you all the way back to the other side, back to, to, uh, to one screen, extreme. Uh, we do a, the AI hardware acceleration uh, using photonics and other electronics. So all of the AI, cool AI stuff you heard today running on something. It's running on hardware versus at the edge or on the, uh, on the uh, cloud. Uh, we have an amazing group of uh, team from MIT, uh, a couple of uh, professor advisors and uh, veterans such as myself and uh, most time in uh, VP of engineering. So a very strong team. Um, we talked about the problems. The problems that you see today is amazing demand growth uh, for services. So the data centers, the automotive, and many, many other industries that you heard today have a lot of requirement in additional uh, more data and, uh, and getting into the uh, new and bigger and bigger models to accommodate that. So basically, uh, what you have today are four solutions that everybody is using. You have the CPU with the high flexibility, the GPU, then the FPGA, and now you see a lot of uh, AC companies coming out with a more dedicated, more efficient solution and capability. The problem with that all of them has is they are, they are digital, they are electronics. So they're, uh, uh, they're banded by the geometry and by the speed that they can run. Uh, what we provide is a new part of uh, fundamental leap of performance using uh, integrated photonics, uh, photonics inside the A6 to provide extended efficiency. Uh, another, what happened in the industry, and you ask why not, why, why now, why not before? So yes, it happened before, not for ML. The big changes that happened in ML is that uh, the widespread of use and uh, on the inference side, that's where the analytics is done, what you see is that uh, low resolution is now very capable and very high efficiency in terms of uh, 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 the results that you get using that. In addition to that, the, the math behind the machine learning is statistically linear, which is a huge advantage because now you can do huge matrix multiplication, and that's a big advantage for photonics. Um, so all in all, photonics provide you a high throughput. You're looking at about 20 to 30x improved in, uh, in, uh, in throughput over standard electronics. There's no heat, this is just light doing the multiplication in photonics running through the, uh, through the integrated circuit. And of course, uh, latency, you're looking at speed of light. So uh, uh, very, very low latency. Um, what we did is we came up with the first test chip that we confirmed that this thing is working. Uh, the original assumption of using uh, this type of architecture, uh, we learned from that a lot. We understand where the uh, hiccups, where the problems, and what the issues of scaling. And that's now we're working on the next phase of bringing this into a, a scaling a high production capability uh, to run uh, very efficiently. So if you look at the markets, uh, we're looking for uh, OEM, ODM service providers in data center, both on the cloud, enterprise, uh, video surveillance and analytics, uh, servers and AI uh, integrated service providers, auto autonomous, autonomous driving cars, Wherever you have high throughput demand with low latency, that's something that we can be very beneficial. 
So uh, come and see us. I'll be outside. At, uh, there'll be a big podium that uh, uh, with a big uh, banner that uh, you see us. Uh, come talk to me. If you have a connection to the industry, uh, we have already a few pilots in the run, but we're looking for more. So thank you very much. Hope you enjoy your lunch and have a nice day.